Hi everybody, it's me, Adrian Lee, the wandering art historian. I'm so glad you could join us for another video. As you know, we're talking about how to read a painting. And if you've been watching the videos thus far, you know that we've been talking about looking for the clues. If every piece of art or painting um, is a mystery to be solved, you need to look for the clues. And in our early videos, we talked about colors, symbols, and stories in our everyday lives and looking at pop culture um, as a way to warm up those art history muscles. But now we're gonna dive into a more intensive look at color in art. And let me tell you, we're gonna have the most amazing time. How are we gonna do it? Um, we're gonna start part one today, orange, purple, and green. We'll be looking at those three colors. Part two will be dedicated to red. Part three, yellow. And part four will be all about the color blue. Um, if you want more information than these videos, like if you wanna keep researching color on your own, I would highly recommend these two books. The Secret Lives of Color by Cassie St. Clair came out in 2016 and it is awesome. I would also recommend this book by Vasily Kandinsky. He was an abstract painter titled Concerning the Spiritual in Art. This is from 1910-1912 and I'm gonna give you a heads up. Kandinsky was a lawyer before he became an artist so this book can be really dry and kind of challenging to read. It's fascinating, but it can be a little rough sometimes. Um, so to help you out, I'm actually going to include some quotes from this book in our upcoming discussions on color. So you don't have to read it unless you really want to. One reason why you may want to read it is that Kandinsky had synesthesia. Do you know what synesthesia is? It's amazing. It's um, when your senses adopt the sense, the abilities of another sense. And what that means is Kandinsky could hear colors. Yeah, that's real. He could hear colors. So when we quote his book, he'll actually be making very musical references to his perspectives on color. And I love that. And I think that's really cool. Okay, so let's get started. Um, we're gonna kick things off with the color orange. Now, the one reason why I wanted to start this discussion with orange, purple, and green is because it can be kind of challenging to study color in art. One of the reasons why is the meaning behind a color changes from culture to culture. Also, the meaning of colors change over time. A color could start out with kind of a negative context change to something positive and then a hundred years later go back to being negative. Um, and it's also challenging because sometimes a color has both positive and negative connotations at the same time. It's, 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 a, it's a lot of work, okay? For example, orange, we film these videos in the state of Florida and orange is a big color for our state because of oranges and orange trees. Um, also because of beautiful sunsets and sunrises. Um, and then, you know, those are things that you find in nature and they're very happy and joyful and uplifting. But then if I were to ask you, how does the phrase Agent Orange make you feel or a clockwork orange? Yeah, not great, right? Kind of negative connotations. And that's the issue that we're dealing with. So think about how we see color in our everyday lives and how it can have both good and negative uh, connotations. Carrots are orange, obviously, but they weren't always orange. Um, they were actually bred from their original shades of purple and yellow to be orange by the Dutch. And in that case, the Dutch um, have acquired that color orange. You see, see that a lot. Um, and their personal iconography as a, as a nation. It's very interesting. Um, look at this example. Saffron robes are predominantly orange and they're the robes worn by Buddhist monks. Um, the young initiates wear these orange robes um, showing their vow of humility and renunciation as they are kind of removing themselves from the material world. But what's interesting is, is that saffron, the 
spice that's used to dye those robes, those beautiful orange colors, is the most expensive spice in the world. Um, in 2018, it clocked in at $2,000 per pound. So it's interesting that the most expensive spice in the world is used to dye robes proclaiming a renunciation of material things. Very contradictory, but pretty cool, right? Think about what else is orange. Prison jumpsuits so that you can spot the, the prisoner while everyone else is wearing their uniforms, right? Um, warning signs are often orange to catch our attention and give us a heads up that we gotta be more cautious. Do you notice I have an image of the flag of Ireland and that it has orange, white, and green. Do you know why that is? Well, the green represents Catholicism, the orange represents Protestantism, and the white represents the peace that can be found between the two groups. That being said, green is often associated with St. Patrick, a Catholic saint, and the color orange is often associated with Protestantism and activism as a form of protest. So even today in the 21st century, you'll see a lot of protesters, regardless of what they're protesting, sometimes wear orange because that color has been associated with it for so long. Isn't that fascinating? I think so. Now, what does Kandinsky have to say about the color orange, okay? Let's see what he has to say. Orange is like a man convinced of his own powers. Its note is that of the Angelus or of an old violin. Now that's a really interesting interpretation, don't you think? I love the reference to the old violin, but he also references the Angelus. What is the Angelus? Well, let me show you this painting, which is titled The Angelus. Um, and this is by a gentleman named Jean-Francois Millet. Uh, this was painted about 1857, 1859. And here we see two peasants in a field and it looks like they are bowing their heads in prayer. And that's true. Um, the Angelus was actually the bells that were rung around the end of the workday to kind of signal that the day's work has come to an end. And these peasants are actually taking that time to bow their heads in prayer as a way of giving thanks. Even though their harvest for the day, very meager, here we have their basket, only a few potatoes. Um, and it's very cool that Mie includes the hint of a church steeple in the background to imply the ringing of the bells. Now, this is a very human reference, right? Um, poor peasants giving thanks for a meager harvest. But this image definitely struck a chord with artists, um, even into the modern art time period, um, with a couple of really cool um, references. Two of those references I would really like to share with you now. Here we have this beautiful sketch um, honoring Millet's painting of the Angelus, and this is done by Vincent van Gogh. Um, and then we have this really fascinating interpretation on the right, and if you guessed that that was by Salvador Dali, you are correct. So this idea of the Angelus, definitely um, something that artists reference again and again, something that they connect with, some symbolism. Um, but let's also um, talk about this quote by Kandinsky. Just as orange is red brought nearer to humanity by yellow, so violet is red withdrawn from humanity by blue. And I know what you're thinking. Jeez, Adrian, you weren't kidding. This guy's definitely a lawyer, right? Oh, how do, you, how do you decipher that? Well, I've come up with this little diagram and he's basically saying yellow is what pulls red down to humanity and what gives us orange. And blue is what pulls red up to the heavens and what gives us 
purple. And I think that's interesting because, boy, doesn't it imply that everything kind of stems from the color red? Or at least in Kandinsky's mind, it does. Also, what I would really like to point out is with this theory, do you notice that it puts blue, red, and yellow, the three primary colors, front and center? Yeah, I have a feeling that's gonna come up again in future videos. Mm -hmm. So now let's take a look at one of these colors. Let's look at the color purple. Purple. Think about how we use the color purple or how we refer to the color purple in our everyday lives. Um, it's often associated with royalty and imperial power. Um, that applies not only to the West, but also to ancient South America. It's associated with pride and grandeur and wealth. Um, in ancient Greece, they liked to dye their robes purple, but it was a very extremely difficult color or dye to manufacture. They had to, they had to squish a lot of mollusks. They just had to mush them to get that purple dye. Ugh, poor, poor mollusks. Um, it was the favorite color of Cleopatra and it was the only color toga worn by the son of Julius Caesar. Again, we're associating purple with very high ranking people from history, right? Um, in ancient Japan, it was a forbidden color. Um, it was off limits to ordinary people and it was only for the highest ranking citizens. Here are a few additional examples. To be born in the purple, has anybody ever heard that phrase before? Um, believe it or not, um, birthing rooms were sometimes covered in purple objects and purple drapes for royalty when um, someone was giving birth so that that child was quite literally born in the purple, right? Okay. Amethyst was thought to prevent drunkenness in ancient Greece. They would either grind up amethysts into like a powder and put it in their, their wine, or they would just drop whole amethysts or wear them. Um, don't think that works. Um, Oscar Wilde said, quote, never trust a woman who wears mauve. It always means they have a history. Oof, gee, Oscar Wilde, well, you're not one to talk, are you? Um, and then of course we also have the purple one, Prince, and his famous song, Purple Rain. Now, what does Kandinsky think of the color purple? He said, violet is therefore both in the physical and spiritual sense a cooled red. It is consequently rather sad and ailing. It is worn by old women and in China as a sign of mourning. In music, it is an English horn or the deep notes of wood instruments, for example, a bassoon. Huh, he has pretty strong feelings about the color purple. Um, but what's really interesting is Purple was a very important color to a certain group of modern artists known as the Impressionists. Yes, here we have four images by the Impressionist himself, Monet. Um, and a lot of it has to do with the fact that they were outdoors painting in nature. And it was the Impressionists who realized, hey, when we look at um, plants, trees, rivers, mountains, what have you, and the light filters through the atmosphere, we realize that shadows aren't necessarily black or even gray. They're actually shades of deep blue or shades of violet and purple. So we see a lot of these purple colors in their work um, in reference to shadows seen in nature. I think that's really cool. However, the people of their time actually, they didn't necessarily think that was awesome. Violet and purple was also associated with madness during the end of the 1800s when the Impressionists were getting going. So people thought the Impressionists were suffering from violettomania or craziness caused by the color purple. Hey, okay. Um, so here we have a few examples of Monet 
and the Impressionists and their use of the color purple. Uh, Manet, Edouard Manet in 1881 said, quote, fresh air is violet. Three years from now, the whole world will work in violet. I love that, that's really nice. Let's talk about the color green. I, I have a special connection to the color green. I love it. Um, it's often a reference to the color of life itself, springtime, youth, because we do use the expression to be green means to be inexperienced or young. Um, and that phrase actually dates to the Middle Ages. Shakespeare coined the term green-eyed jealousy from the Merchant of Venice. Um, he also referenced the green-eyed monster which doth mock the meat it feeds on from Othello. Uh, and he believed that green costumes were bad luck. Now, that is another reference to the Middle Ages and the idea that green was associated with alchemy and the dark arts. Okay, so alchemists were constantly trying to mix things together to create gold, right? Didn't work, obviously. Um, but that started to be associated with the dark arts, okay? Um, and what's interesting is that there was nothing in the Middle Ages that would produce a pure green color when it came to dye. You always had to mix other things together to get the color green for a dye. And because you had to start mixing things together, just like the alchemists did, green started to become associated with alchemy and the dark arts, and it was a color that was shunned for quite a while. I think that's pretty cool. Um, what's very interesting is that today, not only is it associated with ecology and recycling and preserving the Earth's resources, it's also kind of associated with poison and toxicity, right? Um, uh, the seven deadly sins also have corresponding colors and green is associated with avarice, which is extreme greed for wealth and material gain. And interestingly enough, what color is money in the United States? <gasps> green. Now what's really interesting is The Wizard of Oz by L. Frank Baum. If you think about it, the Wicked Witch of the West is green and she is the big villain of the story. However, where is Dorothy trying to get to in The Wizard of Oz? The Emerald City. So that's her destination is a positive thing, right? Very contradictory, but also kind of cool. Um, does anyone recognize the gentleman on the far right? Um, clearly he looks uh, very religious. Um, he has a halo, so he's probably a saint. Um, and he's pointing at something on the ground, which is a, a lot of snakes. And if you said that was a St. Patrick, the patron saint of the Emerald Isle, you would be correct. Now what's interesting about this is the fact that the original color associated with St. Patrick was the color blue, because blue was the chief color of the Catholic Church, and he is a Catholic saint. That's why in this depiction of St. Patrick, he's wearing a white tunic with a blue tunic over it. But as he became more and more associated with Ireland and the Emerald Isle, he adopted the color green, which is why you see the green cloak on top. Fascinating, isn't it? Um, what does Kandinsky have to say about the color green? Green is the most restful color that exists. On exhausted men, this restfulness has a beneficial effect, but after a time, it becomes wearisome. And that makes sense. I mean, if you think about it, um, Doctor's offices, dentist's offices are often green to kind of calm you down before you see the doctor, right? Also, celebrities, before they go on stage, are waiting where? In the green room, right? Okay. In the hierarchy of colors, green is the bourgeoisie, self-satisfied, immovable, narrow. Oof. In music, the absolute green is represented by the placid middle tones of a violin. Hmm, that sounds kind of nice. 
I want to tell you about something very interesting that happened in the 1800s. And we're going to use this piece of art here. It's actually a political cartoon dating from 1862. Now, remember how I said during the Middle Ages, green was associated with alchemy and the dark arts? Well, by the early 1800s, chemists finally figured out a way to create a green dye mix in their chemicals and what have you. And it was so popular that in the capital of the art world, Paris, France, it was trending all over the place. So much so that people referred to it as Paris green. How much did they love this color? It not only was a dye for their clothes, it became a paint. They were painting their walls. It was put in the wallpaper. Um, not only were they wearing it as fashionable adults, they were dressing their children in this color. Um, they were painting it on their book covers. All They were putting this color green everywhere they could. The only problem is, in a few short years, people started dying. Yes, dying. And they started to trace these deaths back to the dye that was used in all of these fabrics, paints, wallpapers, and what have you, okay? To find out that one of the chemicals that these scientists used to create this amazing, trendy, fashionable color green was arsenic. Yeah, so people were covering themselves in this trendy color and poisoning themselves to death. And that is what is referenced by this political cartoon, The Arsenic Waltz, the new dance of death dedicated to the green wreath and dress mongers. Uh, puts a whole new spin on dying for fashion, doesn't it? Yikes. Um, also, towards the end of the 1800s, France, um, especially in Paris, um, had what they called the green hour between 5 and 6 p.m. Why did they call it that? Well, it was because of what they were drinking. And what they were drinking was absinthe. And absinthe was called the green fairy because that stuff will mess you up. There's a reason why it's illegal in some places. My favorite thing about the color green, though, of course, is Kermit. And his song, It's Not Easy Being Green, what a powerful song. When he sings, when green is all there is to be, it could make you wonder why. But why wonder, why wonder? I'm green and it'll do fine. It's beautiful and I think it's what I want to be. And I think that's cool because frogs are green and he's realizing he was born green. Why should he be any other color? We should just be who we were born to be. And I love that. I hope you're enjoying these videos. I'm enjoying making them, so I hope you're enjoying watching them. If so, um, toss a couple of coins in my virtual tip jar if you like. I'm so grateful you're tuning in day in, day out, subscribing. Maybe you're sharing these videos with your family and friends and people that you know who are interested in learning about art. That means so much to me. Um, I, I am the Wandering Art Historian and I will see you next time for another video.